for Easter. It's called Lent. We'll be following the holding evening prayer service in this booklet here. Just a couple of things to note as we move through that service. Uh, first of all, that the song um, is in two groups. So we will have group one here and group
apostles in the second chapter. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. The light shines in the darkness. Well, I welcome you all uh, this evening uh, to Brent and, uh, and also to the wall. Um, kind of reminds me of a story when I was uh, younger, when I was playing uh, football on the Lake Bend Bobcat football team. You know, we all had our uniforms on. Of course, here we had our numbers, but my mom used to always say that I never had to look at your number because I could tell where you were on the field just by the way that you walked. You know, and um, so I must have a, so welcome to the walk, <laughs> we'll be practicing that, but other people have told me too that uh, uh, they, um, they see similarities in the way that I walk, and they always can tell Zachary, also my oldest son, because evidently we, I don't pay attention to things like that, but uh, other, other people uh, do, but welcome to the walk, uh, this is our book that we're studying now uh, in the season of, of Lent. Uh, we started with our Bible studies already, so if you're looking to uh, follow along with us, read along with us, there are books uh, available for you, and, and we can get more, so you don't need to be shy around here, and uh, there's plenty of room at Bible, uh, Bible studies, too, uh, for you to join us as well. But this is called the Walk, the Five Essential Practices of the Christian Faith. I think on our journey uh, through life, uh, we're tempted to think that the most important thing is how far we get. But this is not true. This is not true. The most important thing, I believe, is learning to walk with God. That is the most important thing in, in life. And it's, it's amazing if you think about it, even just Scripture itself, how much movement there is in the Bible from the time Adam and Eve leave the Garden of Eden they and their descendants started walking around right up to the closing lines of the New Testament. So no one really settles down for long, but they're walking. They're walking with, with God. And it's always when people stop moving around that they get into so much trouble with God. It's when they stop moving. It's when they stop growing. It's when they stop praying. It's when they stop taking risks. It's when they stop living by faith. All of which is a way of telling God kind of just to leave us alone because we are happy to settle for this uh, little life that we think is good enough. But for God, it is never good enough. God wants us to keep walking. This is one of the reasons why Jesus keeps calling people to leave home and to follow Him. You have to walk with God. So I hope that this theme of walking with God resonates with you because we're going to be spending the next six weeks on, on, this, on this theme of walking. We'll be discovering what that walk might look like. Now, for me, uh, this image of walking with God is that of communion. It is that of intimacy. And it is that of friendship. So to walk with God, Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian, one of the greatest theologians in the Middle Ages, claimed that the purpose of all his theology was to help humans live as a friend of God. And so he writes, and I put the words on the screen for you, he wrote that we can be and are called to be and must be the friends of God. That is what our life is, a life of ever-deepening friendship with God. And so as with any deepening friendship along the way, we discover more about God, and then we discover more about ourselves as we are together, as we, as we walk together. That is the process of walking together. And it's important.
times. Now, I was reading an article not long ago about how often people avoid going to the doctor. Are you one of those people that avoids going to the doctor? Because Dr. Phil would like to know that. So. <laughs> Show my devotion to my wife, Emily. 
church, those people were devoted to certain things. They were devoted to worship. And they were devoted to prayer. Which means they were devoted to having this continual, interactive, participative, participative engagement with God. It was something that they were alive at. And that's how we receive grace, and that's how we live by grace. It is a vital sign for us. To dabble means I do something when it's convenient for me. To dabble means that I'll do it when I'm in the mood. To dabble means that I'll do it when I need something or when I have to. They weren't dabbling in these things. They were devoted to these things. These were people who were convinced that now through Jesus Christ, through his teaching, through his way of life, through his presence with them, that they could live in the character and in the power of God. So they made this their way of life, this way of Jesus, they made as the ultimate priority for them. And they would not miss it. They sacrificed for it. So this week, our vital sign is prayer. And our vital sign is worship. And you can just kind of, in your own mind, see where you're at between dabbling and devotion in these two things. Now, the book even invites us to grade ourselves in these things, kind of like how we're graded in school. And so we can do that. Worship a priority. Are you a 90% attender? You get an A. Are you an 80% attender? You get a B. Are you a 70% attender? Do you come, you know, from once? drop down to 50%. So just assess in your own mind. I mean, this isn't to make you feel guilty. But are we dabbling? Or are we devoted? Are we dabbling about worship? Or are we devoted to worship? But the book also, so, so we just want to get real concrete about this as we finish. We want to get real concrete about this because as a people, even with all of our technology, our conveniences, all of our comforts, there are other signs as well that point to our vitality. What the studies consistently report is that our dissatisfaction in life is increasing. Our anxiety is, guess what? Increasing. And our well-being is going down. There is a Gallup study that is called the World Happiness Report. And it has shown that for the past seven years in our country, well-being has sharply declined every year, and dissatisfaction has gone up. So the book and studies have invited us into this practice of gratitude that is so important. And so when we think about our prayer life, when we think about worship, we want to also think about gratitude. In the Bible, in the story of the Exodus, every day for 40 years in the desert, God gave them a miracle of food, and it was called manna. It was called manna. And what is manna? Well, it's sort of like a wafer-like bread and substance. I'm not real sure. Maybe it's similar to what we have when we gather for Holy Communion. I don't know. Uh, was it gluten-free? I don't know. Was it organic? I don't know. God probably bought through all of people's allergies. Back then in the Bible, I don't know. But every day God gave them a gift of manna from heaven. He provided for their hunger. He blessed them with enough food. Every day God gave them the gift of manna. And then Moses instructs the Israelites this interesting thing in verse 32. He says, take a jar of manna in it and keep it for the generations to come. Hold on to it. Keep it. Moses wanted them to remember what God has done for them. When they were tempted to complain, when they were tempted to grumble, they could look at this jar and remember, yes, this is a God who provides for us. This is a God who blesses us. So 
So I thought today, as you leave, we're going to give everybody a jar of manna. So you can just count your blessings and not your burdens. Well, we're not going to give you a jar of manna. But we are going to give you an opportunity to count your blessings. And so we have this guy that we call, we have this guy that we call a Grateful Journal Guy. And we want you to take one of those. And so every day, every day during Lent, and those of you who read the book, you know about this, but you can take this journal and you can write down the things that you are grateful. So these are available for, for you. Um, there's another one that could just be bullets. So you just have to write three things a day that you're grateful for. How God has blessed you for the, for the day. The psalmist says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That's what we want for ourselves. That's what we want for each other. We would have a heart of wisdom. One of my favorite theologians, Ferris Bueller, some of you know him, in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, he says, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you can miss it. So we don't want you to miss your blessings. We invite you to look around and to count your blessings and then to be intentional about that this season of life. We want you to be grateful because it has the ability to change our mindset, to be of the mindset of Jesus. That's what being grateful does. It can help us feel better. It can help us treat others better. And some research has shown that it can actually make us healthier people. Don't you want to be healthier? It's in gratitude. It starts with gratitude. It's, it starts with that understanding that life is a gift, that life is a miracle. I want to be grateful for these moments I have. I don't want to spend those few moments being frustrated or annoyed. So take some time during this time, would you? And we'll come back next week.